Subscribe. Vanillaware is a weird developer. They're responsible for one of the best game stories I've ever played with 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, an interconnected sci-fi narrative with middling RTS-like combat, but a story that is woven so intricately between its characters with constant surprises that it raised the bar for what I thought a video game could do. Simultaneously, they made Dragon's Crown. A game I genuinely hate. For years, I looked jealously on at the PS3 because of Dragon's Crown. Its jaw-dropping art style and titillating character designs I thought were just the surface of a deep action RPG. Turns out it was a belt scroller beat-em-up, which isn't a bad thing if it wasn't for its dearth of narrative and repetitive, unimpactful combat. With Vanillaware's potential for greatness and potential for shittiness, does their newest title, Unicorn Overlord, reach the heights of Aegis Rim or sink to the substandard depths of Dragon's Crown? Keep watching to find out. development history. Unicorn Overlord was released March 8, 2024, developed by Vanillaware, published by Sega in the States and Atlas in the Japans. Sorry, I just watched Shogun. In preparation, I played a little of Vanillaware's closest analog to Unicorn Overlord in their catalog, the Trapped in Japan PSP tactical RPG Grand Knight's History. We will circle back to that game in the distant future, but the sample I played gave me enough faith that even though it was a story light, repetitive, portable title, it had way more going on than Dragon's Crown. In certain articles about this game leading up to its release, I saw that it had a 10 year development cycle, but that's not completely accurate. Unicorn Overlord was kind of on the back burner while Vanillaware worked on many other titles during that 10 year period leading up to its release. And like many other Vanillaware titles, George Kamatani helped with the funding with his own money to see that the game actually made it all the way out. Unicorn Overlord's director, Takafumi Noma, has never directed another game. His previous credits include programming on New Super Mario Bros., Muramasa the Demon Blade, Odin's Fear, La Farve, Dragon's Crown, Dragon's Crown Pro, 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim, The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, Animal Crossing Wild World, and Dobutsu no Mori, and Super Mario 64 DS, and Animal Crossing City Folk. Gameplay. The gameplay of Unicorn Overlord doesn't reinvent the Wheel of Fortune from the Ogre Battle series. It streamlines it and presents it with such beautiful art and sound for a modern gamer that it's hard not to say, if you want to play an Ogre Battle game, but new. Part of me wants to just link to my Ogre Battle or Ogre Battle 64 review to summarize the gameplay, but I suppose that would be lazy. In Unicorn Overlord, unlike most tactical RPGs, you control groups of characters that play out battles automatically based on how you program them instead of issuing commands directly to each individual unit. So in this way, Unicorn Overlord plays more like an RTS than your traditional isometric grid-based TRPG. This more hands-off approach is necessary, you will see, because of the scope of the battles. In Final Fantasy Tactics skirmishes, you might deploy five units against a slightly larger enemy party on a battlefield the size of a church or a drawbridge. In Unicorn Overlord, by the end you're fielding as many as ten parties of five units each. I'm not great at math, but yeah. Issuing orders to every one of your 50 characters over stages that simulate miles of terrain would be unwieldy with any other combat system. Just like Ogre Battle, the win conditions consist of capturing the main enemy encampments or defeating the big bad boss of the specific stage. Losing boils down to losing your main outpost or sometimes the defeat of a guest unit. You're given a few valor points at the beginning of each stage. By using these valor points, you can deploy your troops or if you wanna get strategical about it, you can spend them on special unique abilities to destroy barricades, steal enemy stamina, teleport, and more. 
To get more valor points, you must defeat enemy units and or capture enemy bases. Most are optional, but liberating these points can net you items and, more importantly, stem the tide of respawning soldiers that these occupied camps will squirt out after a set amount of time. You also have to be careful to secure your own base. The game waits a few battles before trying this, but eventually the enemy will bait you with a false sense of security to go all out and then try to send hidden units from a forest or a fast-moving flying unit to steal your main base from behind. If you're not careful at all times, you could lose the battle if you leave your main base unprotected, because if there's not one to defend it, then BAM, you lose. You've got things to worry about like terrain, which again, works just about the same as the Ogre Battle series. The mobility of your unit and what terrain they work best on is determined by the leader of that party. A Griffin soldier will give that unit the ability to fly over anything and capture mountain bases with ease, but every advantage has a disadvantage. The flying units are extra weak against archers and have lower stamina. Stamina is the amount of times your unit can battle an enemy unit before having to rest. At rest, the unit is susceptible to first strike damage because, well, they sleepy. This usually means a one-hit KO, so leaving your units in a position where they might be at zero stamina is something to be avoided at all costs. Certain items and abilities in outposts can give your units more stamina, or let them fight without losing stamina. The stamina system makes it less feasible to do what I did playing Pokemon as a kid. You can't just put all your rare candies into Charizard and flamethrower your way to victory. Well, not exactly. I did create a powerhouse unit with Elaine and friends, but you need to have at least two or three strong units to bear the burden, or else the time limit the game imposes will surely defeat you even if the enemy doesn't. Using your valor points wisely, intelligently guarding your own base, cutting off enemy reinforcements by capturing bases, using the right units depending on enemy formation and terrain. It all sounds like a lot, and it would have been, maybe, if I hadn't experienced this all before with Ogre Battle. The game does ease you into these systems slower than I'm blurting them out. First, there's the obligatory unwinnable prologue battle where you play as your mother as your kingdom and birthright are being defenestrated. The first battle shows you some of the basics of how the battles will play out and movement around the map without giving you direct control over anything else. It also shows you how cool and powerful your units will eventually become. Then flash forward 10 years later and the rest of the tutorial battles drip feed you the remaining concepts that Ogre Battle <coughs> Unicorn Overlord is built on. But what makes me like Unicorn Overlord and why I call it a tactical RPG as opposed to a strategy RPG like I would consider Ogre Battle is the amount of character and unit customization. Sure, Ogre Battle let you choose how to lay out your party and their positioning, but Unicorn Overlord takes it to a whole nother level. On top of way more items to play around with, you have a Final Fantasy XII-like gambit system to program your units for very specific scenarios, despite the battles playing out automatically. For instance, there is a witch class that debuffs the enemy party by targeting, by default, the front row. You can instead prioritize the back row, and also tell your archers to do the same. In a scenario where the enemy unit is set up with big bulky bruisers in the front and pesky healers in the back, this can be the solution to what seems an impossible battle. Figuring out the best way to tackle each battle with the amount of freedom Unicorn Overlord gives you is what I found most delightful about this game. There is a handy, some would say too handy, pre-battle calculator that shows you how much damage you will deal versus how much you will take, Changing the positioning of your troops and or your gambits will show you how effective your strategy is, but if things aren't going your way, then it's time to watch the battle unfold. Only by watching the battles play out can you see why certain strategies fail before they can get off the ground. You might have this idea that your wizard is going to blast the front row with an ice attack and freeze them, rendering at least a few attacks moot, but can't understand why the damage calculator is disagreeing with that approach. Then, sitting down, you see that the initiative, think speed of the unit, of your wizard is too slow, and before he can pop off his ice attack, he's being sniped by an enemy archer or impaled by a cavalry unit that can pierce an entire column of your guys. If you change the formation to include a unit that can block one of those attacks or equip an item that increases the wizard's initiative or helps him evade an attack, then you go from certain death to certain victory. We haven't gotten into AP and PP, active and passive points, and how those work, but those are best understood by playing the game. I had a lot of fun with the game. 
the progression system of earning honors by beating battles and rebuilding the towns you've liberated, and then cashing in those honors to up your unit size and evolve your characters, was a nice feedback loop. Those damn honey apples, though. In all the interviews with the staff that I read, they never name-dropped Ogre Battle, but for anyone that has played Ogre Battle, the similarities are clear. Specifically, the 2x3 battle unit system, automated battles, map view, and the liberating of towns. That isn't to say that Unicorn Overlord doesn't push the format further. The Gambit system, where you get to program the priority of what moves your units use based on such factors as enemy unit health or class, is beautifully satisfying for those who want to micromanage the perfect party. Story The story pales in complexity to 13 Sentinels. It's a quite basic fantasy RPG adventure when it comes down to it. Even its twists aren't shocking in the slightest. The only meaningful choice you make throughout the story is who to form the covenant with. I chose Scarlet because she seemed like the default choice presented by the narrative and maybe two other reasons. <laughs> Elaine, the main character, is Perfect Boy, whose kingdom is taken over at the start of the game. He is sequestered off on the island of Pelavia with Joseph, his caretaker knight. And once you defeat the big bad baddie, Hodrick, the complexity of the story is sucked out like a cheese brought at a whorehouse. Hodrick was one of the few knights at the beginning flashback prologue that guided your mother before she went off to face her fate against the bigger baddie, Galerius. To see him fighting for the enemy presents, at first, an interesting development. It's been ten years since the kingdom was overtaken. Have all our former allies pledged allegiance to Zenoira? After defeating Hodrick, your unicorn ring shines and removes the spell from Hodrick. I won't say the game doesn't try to make the story more complex than it first appears, but at the end of the day, there aren't any characters who stray far off the black-white dichotomy. The moral complexity of the Ogre Battle series is not found here in Unicorn Overlord. Gameplay-wise, I'm okay with that. Having to worry about chaotic and lawful alignment when liberating towns back in Ogre Battle was more of a headache than a boon for me in those games. If there's a Chaos Frame parallel in Unicorn Overlord, I was never tipped off. The game does attempt to give its characters slightly more depth by including rapport conversations. As you pair up different characters within your unit and have them battle together, you unlock these rapport conversations. Think the skits from the Tales series. They're short, but some of them are pretty well written, and they add a much needed level of engagement with the characters. The main problem with Unicorn Overlord, for me, is the lack of time with each character. That's the downside of having such a large cast. Even with a runtime of over 70 hours, when you have 70 unique characters, that means at most dedicating an hour to each character. And this isn't a game where you spend the majority of your time in cutscenes. The ratio of character interaction slash story versus gameplay is about 1 to 10. And even that estimation might be optimistic. So just to boil it down, you're given maybe six minutes worth of time with each character. Obviously most of the time, non-gameplay segments are focused on our core cast. Aside from a side character's introductory mission, you rarely hear a peep out of them unless you seek out their rapport conversations. And those being unvoiced and playing out on the world map in the aforementioned chibi form don't build a strong relationship between the player and the screen time starved side characters. This is a common flaw among tactical RPGs of this scale. The Valkyria Chronicles games have the same issue, and there's not a great way to solve it, unless the story is laser-focused on a small group of soldiers. I think Unicorn Overlord does a decent job attempting to remedy this with the rapport conversations. The sheer amount of them and their combinations among your units is admirable. Unicorn Overlord is clearly an example of the developer making a game first and then fashioning a story to fit that game. Before such cruel reality, I am utterly powerless. Whereas 13 Sentinels felt like the opposite. The gameplay in Overlord is clearly superior to 13 Sentinels, and the story in 13 Sentinels ranks far over Overlord. I pray one day we will see Vanillaware walk with both feet now that they've shown each leg is capable.
year 895 of the Hollow Chronicle, claiming himself a scion of the fallen Sonoiran Empire, Cornea's once decorated General Valmor rebelled against his erstwhile home at the seat of its monarchy, Grand Corinne. Graphics. It's Vanillaware's most consistent strength. No one does 2D anime, big titty girls, quite like our boy George. In Unicorn Overlord, you're looking at the world from a top-down view and chibified. If they had taken some opportunities during certain story moments to shift the camera down and experience the world from the character's perspective, it could have made me feel like I was in Fevrith instead of looking down on it. The cutscenes take place in Vanilla Ware's straight-on bread-and-butter camera angle, but having played 13 Sentinels, Dragon's Crown, and now Odin Sphere, I want to see those gorgeous 2D anime god and goddesses gesticulate more than a flash animation from early 2000s Newgrounds. Music. No. The music by Basescape deserves a special shout out. The track from the prologue pushes forward the vocal style from 13 Sentinels even further. Listen to this track, bitch! Unicorn Overlord is a fun game, a beautiful game to look at, and there's a lot of content to keep you busy. If you're looking for a fun, beautiful, content-rich game, here you go. If you're looking for characters in a world that you'll keep thinking about after the game is over, I mean, I'll be thinking about Amalia for a while, but beyond that, no. A game both visually and sonically amazing, solid mechanics, and a likable cast. I would put it with Triangle Strategy as a very good game in a genre that doesn't get much mainstream play. It may not be an instant classic and lacks the richness of its forebears, but the presentation and ease of play make Unicorn Overlord a welcome sight. I've been trying to think about how I would improve the game. There are a few too many repetitive side quests, but they're short enough and the rewards are good enough that I didn't mind them too much. The manner you explore the world in chibi form at first was charming, but I can't help but feel like it took away from the scale of the world. Sometimes convenience for the player in that way can rob from the grandness of it all. I really enjoyed Unicorn Overlord. Despite the Milktoast main plot, the game's likable characters, exemplary presentation, and engaging systems make this a highly recommended tactical RPG in the year of our Lord, 2024. On the next episode of the Tactical RPG Odyssey. Uh, maybe finally Tactics Ogre the Night of Lotus? Good. Reason rules the day. Is that why you and Lex spent all your days banging swords down at the shore? Good. You can't just name it Zenobia, okay? Zen... Z... Zenoira. Okay, let's go with that. Zenobi... No. Zenoira. Zenoira.